So welcome back to Using Containers in Bioinformatics. Thanks for sticking with us until day three. This is a collaborative effort between Australian Biocommons and Pawsey Supercomputing Centre and the many different research institutes and universities that the facilitators represent. And it's been a real joy to be a part of. We thank all of our wonderful attendees who have joined us on the journey through the Containers in Bioinformatics uh, workshop series. And uh, thank you so much for joining us on our somewhat experimental approach to the various sessions. I'm Christina Hall from the Australian Biocommons and Backhouse from the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre is here too. And of course, Marco Delapierre from Pawsey will be guiding us through the final part of the workshop. Today is time for you to bring your work and questions. So thanks for letting us know already what you're interested in. Please do head to the breakout groups uh, a spreadsheet if you need to indicate which group you'll be joining today. So today you'll be heading into breakout rooms with different facilitators. We look forward to hearing back from you the interesting things that you come up with in your individual groups. And so facilitators, please think during your session about what you might bring back to the group afterwards for a more lengthy discussion. Just a reminder of how we interact today. Once again, the schedule has all of the links you need um, for the session. We'd uh, ask you to unmute your microphones once you're in the breakout groups. And all interactions again should be on the discussion board. We have a new one there today. Uh, if you want to uh, ask Marco questions or call Marco into your breakout group you can put that into the discussion board. Okay, let's get moving on. I will simply now hand over to Marco and Anne to see if there's any further organisation we need before we head out into our individual rooms to discuss your topics of interest. Yeah, okay, so we, as you've seen in the, in the spreadsheet, we have prepared a number of uh, breakout rooms today based on your uh, interest and input. So we were able to, to create some for some BYO pipelines that some of you have uh, mentioned uh, in the past few days uh, as topics of interest. And then we have uh, yeah, one on graphical applications, one on HPC applications, um, cloud computing and workflow engines. Um, so yeah, I hope that you can enjoy and uh, yeah, and feel free to send us to the breakout rooms. Okay, I am one more person and I am going to open all breakout rooms. Um, you will have about, uh, about an hour to have a good meaty discussion. So um, I'm opening those rooms now. Enjoy the conversation. Yes, I think we, we might have around Robin from the facilitators or a, a single people from each room, maybe no more than five minutes just to report on some uh, interesting outcomes or comments from your specific room. Um, and then maybe after that, uh, after this round, we can have just uh, maybe a, a couple of follow-ups uh, if anyone wants to comment. So maybe we can start from... Uh, uh, room one, so which was led by Andrew and Tayaza. Uh, yeah, any any reports from room one, Andrew? Uh, yeah, so we uh, had a look at Leslie's pipeline for primer design, um, which is something that's not heavy on compute, doesn't really need batching, but it's more about complexity of the uh, dependencies and inputs, and um, it's particularly important to maintain reproducibility in this case. Um, so we sort of had a, Leslie brought us through how the pipeline worked and what the moving parts were, what the inputs were, what the outputs were. Um, and we threw around some ideas about how we might use containers for that, um, whether, and it essentially came down to the pipelines run by a master bash script. And it essentially came down to the question of, should we run the master bash script 
and have all of the tools inside it, like SAM tools and Primer 3 run individually inside their own containers, or in this particular case, is it better to bake the whole thing into a single container uh, for those purposes? Um, and, you know, I think there's still two different ways we could go about it. My feeling was in this case, it was probably worth putting it all in one container um, so that even things like the bash script itself was running inside the container and was reproducible and not subject to weird things like Linux distros that like to swap out um, bash for dash and other versions of the shell and things like that. So um, yeah. Uh, so we, we made a little bit of headway in starting to put together the Docker file that we might use to containerize that. Um, we hit a conda issue with SAM tools and the libssl stuff, which libcrypto stuff, which anyone who's used that's probably already hit before. Um, but yeah, that was 30 seconds before we left the room. So. Thanks, Andrew. So, um, if you uh, do you have anything else to add, I don't know. There's, um, no, it's fine. No, you want just to add. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I guess the we we discuss be best practice quite a bit as well. So, um, in this case, we established that keeping large databases out and importing those as command line arguments while um, running the master script and the messy configurations in this in this pipeline was the best approach. So um, yeah, we were sort of looking at whether this might be a gray area under the only um, compartmentalize um, your programs into containers. It, um, yeah, so we were discussing what the best practice around that might be and, um, and against how that might fit into a production environment where you've got modules set up. And um, so, yeah, that was really helpful as well. So, yeah, um, being able, to, knowing that you can execute something like that um, and, and use command line arguments for the, um, if you have little user input and you need something that is, that is reproducible, um, not in terms of um, reproducible research, but multiple people being able to run it and quickly um, but yeah, that, that was really helpful for me to have that, yeah, that usage of, of containers available. Thanks, Leslie. So let's uh, move to the second room then. Uh, so Sarah or Christian, uh, do you want to comment on, uh, on your discussion that you had? Um, yeah, so we were looking at Cameron's pipeline. Sorry, that's my dog crying in the background. Um, I just shut the door. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Cameron's pipeline was pretty straightforward, um, just doing RNA seq um, mainly with star being the primary tool, but also Trimomatic and FastQ. So we ran into an issue with the Trimomatic um, container because you normally run Trimomatic as a jar file. Um, so I'm not sure where they put the jar file in the interest of getting on with the with the workflow, we just ignored that and went on to the next package. But yeah, that was a bit tricky. Um, I think the actual workflow is fairly straightforward. So Audrey wrote a great sort of um, draft, you know, form to fill out to help you structure your pipeline. Um, so we used that, which she kindly shared with me. Um, so with that, you set up your variables, you import your pipe, your um, containers if you need to, and then um, it's actually fairly straightforward to import whatever bash commands you have that are tool specific and execute them with a container. Um, yeah, uh, we didn't get to the module, I mean the wrapper files, but I suppose that would be the logical next step, um, which would make the experience, you know, a bit nicer, but isn't strictly necessary. But is worth having, I think. Thanks, Sarah. Um, other comments from uh, from the room? Um, yeah, we, we spoke briefly about the art of finding the best Docker container. 
yeah. in terms of just looking at the number of downloads or the the author um because that can be overwhelming at times and um yeah so we started on the show scripting and um uh, for the you know hpc system whether it's pbs or slurm and and conversations led to i guess the benefits of containers the integration uh being the main one uh, but yeah question was you know like how do you if if you have a container how do you know what's in it like how do you know what apps are available um especially if um if it's not like a single use container so to speak yeah. Uh, yeah that's quite it actually i had trimomatic uh, i i i I met Trimomatic uh, a couple of years ago in some pipeline, and yeah, I think it's uh, it's important to have in mind that uh, when you download a container that is developed by others, uh, yeah, a good step is just to inspect the containers to to ensure you know where the packages you need are actually located. So with Singularity, you would just go Singularity shell, open the container, have a look around. Uh, if you know the name of the file you're looking for, you can even use the find utility. Uh, to locate what you need and I remember for Trimomatic it was quite important because uh, I think in the bio container uh, um, artifact uh, the location of the jar file is not trivial so you need to know where it is first and once you know where it is you can then uh, um, use it in, uh, in your script or pipeline so sometimes yeah, inspecting the, the content beforehand can, uh, can help um, and hopefully the document, the tools is rich enough to guide you towards what are the key components in terms of files that you need to locate. Um, we, we had a question in, in our group um, kind of related to that about the security of Docker files. Yeah. Like especially if you, like, how do you know what it's doing? Do, do you have any yeah. comments around, around that? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 right now I've been uh, relating this, this aspect, which is quite crucial, to the one of uh, being able to trust the source of the container. <clears throat> so that's why I, I normally, uh, my first choice is always the bio containers uh, community, because I know that comes out directly of the Bioconda project. I, I know it's a, it's a quite robust project, so I, I tend to trust the containers coming out of of that community. If I can't find a container from them, uh, I, I'm always very cautious in using third-party containers from other people. Uh, I just went the example in our, in our discussion with the, of the guppy based caller. So that's a case where you don't have the bio container and I just managed to find a research group in Paris uh, at uh, the Ecole Normale. They developed the container for the tool and I, even if I don't know them in person, it's one of the few cases where I, where I, I, I evaluated that I could trust the source and so, so I still kept on going using the container. Um, one thing that can uh, help is that uh, the developers provide the Docker file, uh, which means that you can at least see what steps they actually took to, to install the software stack. Uh, if you are unsure yet, yeah, the, the, the next step would be to just build it to your own or to seek assistance at the HPC center or uh, university uh, compute uh, facility, uh, seek assistance from some uh, uh, support staff to, to have it build uh, uh, in-house. Um, because yeah, it's, uh, it's good to know uh, what, uh, what you're running. <clears throat> we haven't seen any direct security threats so far in uh, that, that might uh, hurt the host HPC facility. This has been discussed for long now, but to be honest, right now there hasn't been any any real case of that, despite what happened a couple of weeks ago in Europe that, that didn't seem to be related to, in the end, to containers anyway. Uh, care needs to be taken. Uh, um, it's kind, I mean, you, you're never 100% sure you can just take safe steps. And yeah, my, my best suggestion is always to ask yourself, can I trust the developers of the containers? And can I, do they provide the Docker file that they use? Any, anyone else has comments on this? Because it's, I think it's, Yeah, Marco, that didn't sound quite right. We did have a, um, an urgent singularity upgrade from the developers about mm -hmm. a year or two back. 
when there was uh, enough yes. race yeah. condition where they thought they could exploit. Th thanks, Chris. Yeah, my my history with Singularity is more recent than that, so I wasn't I wasn't aware of that uh, of that uh, issue uh, back then. Yeah, it's it's still a risky thing, but I think most HPC sites have evaluated as useful enough to accept for risk. Yeah. So Nathaniel, have, have you got other uh, or David, have you got other comments from your uh, um, room? David, do do you want to go? I think I did most of the talking, so maybe I can <coughs> alternate yeah. feedback. Oh, I thought uh, well, it was good to uh, uh, just sort of step through a pipeline and uh, uh, I guess I'd make the observation that uh, when people that understand how to use containers uh, combined with people that understand the, the science of what's going on, it's, uh, it gets a good result. I think uh, uh, it's probably unreasonable for uh, both sides to be sort of, you know, stretching themselves to be experts on the, uh, <laughs> on the other side. So uh, no, I thought that uh, was a good, uh, good discussion so we were, we were sort of testing things as we're going along and uh you know uh, uh input from uh, from the group to get uh, to get stuff done discovered a couple of features of uh singularity that i'd uh, must be a new, newer versions that i'm used to or something but anyway that was uh, <laughs> that was a surprise for me thanks david um so let's move to the room uh, uh, led by Audrey. You got any reports from, from your room? Yep. Um, <clears throat> Georgia had a pipeline that she wants to containerize. So uh, actually, I'll let Georgia speak because um, she, she was, you know, the one who, who wanted to, who, yeah, who did it all, really. Cool. <laughs> Georgia? <laughs> yeah, it was. Um... The main question for me was how to incorporate the bash scripts with R. And we went through the wrappers and all of the steps for building the, the script. And we didn't check if it's working or not, but it's, it's everything is very clear at the moment. I don't know if it works, but I will test it. Good to hear. <laughs> Um, we managed to um, do the wrappers as well, so that's why we didn't get to actually test the, the script. But basically, we followed your pipe tree, um, like from start to end, except we replaced the tools with what we need. Um, and I, yeah, I did test outside of the script to see that we can actually um, call and execute, say, for example, fastqc. And um, initially, it didn't because I you had put a variable for the directory um the dollar work and that's why and that's why it didn't it couldn't find the directory even though the executable was there um but yeah it, it was that that uh, prevented us from executing the the command but yeah um georgia will continue to to finish up the, the script and then run and see how we go uh the r part was basically for the command we put so singularity exec, um, the image, so that's the D C two image. And then for the command, we put R so that the container will start R and then we source the R script. Yeah. So uh, we're assuming that should work. Yeah. And that's all. And then curious about any specific package, R packages that are required by those scripts that you will need to incorporate in the container or is it just using standard R commands that ship with the, yes, the basic yes, R yes. installation. Yes, I'll uh, check. Yeah. DEC2 was the container, um, yeah. that was the R, R package that we need. So we just pulled the uh, entire container. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I was asking that because yeah, sometimes some R pipelines uh, require a large number of or larger number of packages. So that, that's when it's one of those cases where you wonder uh, about just a single container that has all of the R packages. So this one sounds like it was a, a, um, a simpler case to handle in that only DSIC was, uh, was key. So the choice that you had to make was, uh, 
uh, kind of straightforward. Um, glad to hear you, you, you managed together to, to work through the pipeline uh, during the discussion. Um, other comments from the room? No, that's all. We had uh, an observer, I think, um, uh, is she here? Candice? Um, yeah, but apart from that, it was just the three of us and uh, yeah, it was all good. Good, thank you. Uh, so the next room is the one on uh, graphical uh, applications. So Chris or Waitama, do you, do you want to comment on uh, what happened in the room? Uh, yeah, sure, I can go. Um, so yeah, we um, spoke about using, mainly it was about using RStudio on a HPC. Um, so as opposed to the cloud um, instance that we we're running um, already. So we sort of walked through um, how we would set up and use um, SSH commands to connect to um, the HPC and run um, an RStudio instance on a, a job submission queue, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it was pretty good. Yeah, so um, what, um, what HPC centers uh, were you, say, referring to in, uh, in this uh, discussion? Did, or was that just a general discussion? Uh, we had a bit of a mix. I mainly <laughs> worked uh, with uh, PBS talk sort of thing, but I think everyone else was on Slurm, but we tried to generalize it um, a fair bit. Yeah. And I just was made aware of your documentation on the Pawsey site that sort of yeah. has that explained. Um, so maybe I'll put that in the chat and other people who are interested can look at that as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I think time we gave a really good summary then of what we just did. Um, I think all of our participants were at UQ actually, <laughs> and maybe okay. Tom or I am. <laughs> hey, that's okay. <laughs> Everyone seems to have different clusters. There's a lot more small clusters out there than I was aware of. Yep. Um, my message for everyone was really, hey, we can totally run our studio, our studio server on all of the big HPC sites. You've got to reach out to your sysadmins though if there's tricks that you don't know. If yeah. the documentation is too dense, we can absolutely walk you through it. Um, and yeah, my time I had some really good documentation on this because I don't use our studio in my day to day. So he had some really good examples to show everyone. Oh, and Q subbing from, so the other tricky part was uh, how does. <coughs> making your R workflow parallel and performant on an HPC. So on the one hand, there's how do you run the graphical application on the HPC? On the other, there's how do you actually do an R analysis utilizing all these hundreds of nodes rather yep. than one node, which is a whole other topic. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure, and yeah. we have a whole workshop, but that's the thing which everyone, all the big HPC sites can help with as well if you're finding your data is exploding. Do you find any common ground on that? I mean, any... Any take on message for the, uh, the wider audience? Mm, it's tricky. Uh, my has got a lovely, there's a lovely package called Futures, which has some magic syntax in it for R. And yeah, parallel programming is hard, but there's loads of people out there who will spend time with you helping with it. Yeah, my, I don't have a lot of that experience with R. I, I have the, always have the impression that I mean, compared to other uh, communities of languages, uh, yeah, there is still possibly a bit more work to be done in tuning and, and engineering the uh, a good performing parallel computing with R. But they're getting there. I mean, yeah, you mentioned futures, which I think is similar to Dask in Python in the end. So it allows you to yeah, distribute uh, tasks across uh, compute nodes. And then the other one is RMPI, which is the, uh, an MPI package for R, but I, I, I only know the name. Uh, I think I, I, I suggested it once to some researchers. But your mileage could vary with the... Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's say I, I don't have a wide experience with that. To be I should warn you, if you're using MPI for a biological application, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> In molecular dynamics, for sure, but for DNA, no. <laughs> Yeah, no, there, there are some, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, honestly, I don't know what people are using RMPI for. I know the package is there, I don't know, I, I can't recall of the... It's, of it's mostly for, for uh, Triple E Parallel, it's just, it's just forking off oh, processes yeah. all over the place. Yeah. It's not, it's not it, very, it ain't rocket science. Cool, 
that is an MPI yeah. version of Blast that people sometimes use. But yeah. As an HPC sysadmin, I have to say, if you have a trivially parallel problem, MPI is not the way to parallelize it. <laughs> you, you, you leverage the queue system and you get much better throughput and you get your problem solved faster. That's like yeah. an interesting debate on MPI versus MPI. <laughs> Next, uh, Any <laughs> other thoughts? Yeah, it's a, it, I think it's uh, possibly a take on messages is that, uh, as, as Chris kind of pointed out, uh, there might really be room for some good discussion in the community of developers and researchers in, in, in the field to, yeah, to talk out yeah, best practices to uh, distribute. Uh, genomics workloads on uh, HPC systems mm. and uh, yeah <laughs> next workshop <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you uh, one thing I wanted to mention yeah on the going back to the R studio component of your discussion so yeah the, the instructions that we provided POSI which were actually started by Brian that uh, was with us until last year uh, we use a SSH channel to, to be able to, to open up graphic, uh, um, to, get to, to reach out the, the compute node and then open up a, a local web page to, to see, to, um, to interact with uh, RStudio. Uh, that might have been an option also during our session the other day. And uh, if I, uh, if I had to repeat uh, the same session today, would possibly uh, give it a go because uh, I, I think a couple of people had issues with, uh, with trying to reach out uh, an HTTP, sorry, an IP address via HTTP. Uh, some of them had their page blocked. So if I had to redo it now, I, I, I now realize the SSH standard way might be uh, a bit less error prone uh, in that if a person can uh, reach, out, reach out with SSH, then they are able to also open up these uh, RStudio sessions uh, for sure. Uh, and to be honest with, with, the, with all of you, yeah, the, this uh, <clears throat> area of uh, all possible ways IT folks in different universities in Australia can uh, block and set firewalls in different, uh, with different rules in different laptops is really a great area. I mean, it's. Uh, I just got an idea two days ago with you guys on uh, all the possible ways that this type of workshop setup can fail, <laughs> uh, depending on how yeah, firewall tools are set up. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, uh, it was a great uh, learning opportunity yeah. for us. <laughs> and, uh, and to me, I mean, to, for me and Anne, it's very interesting to see so I'm going a bit out of the scope now, but uh, I want to share this with you. I think it was interesting to see how we can improve in offering this type of remote uh, workshops and make sure that everyone can uh, log in in a reasonably uh, easy way with uh, no big headache, uh, headaches. Uh, Prior so, to the start. Yeah. yeah. Prior to the start. Stay tuned. There'll be some more. And uh, yeah, that... Uh, we, we mostly engaged uh, so far with uh, local universities, most of our trainings, not all of them, but most of them. And so we kind of gained a lot of experience of how pert IT people set up the laptops of their <laughs> researchers, but we, yeah, we found out that, yeah, different slices, different, different more, more to different domains. Yeah, and also, location, yeah. location, geographic location. Um, Apologies for the diversion, but uh, yeah, I thought it was worth mentioning as well. Um, now back to the our uh, our uh, room plan for for the day. So I think now we we can ask uh, Red or Michael how the how their room went. What were the outcomes of that discussion? All right. Um, so in a way, uh, the the point, the last point from Chris uh, is, is really relevant here. Uh, so a lot of what we deal with in bioinformatics is embarrassingly paralyzable problems. And uh, in our room, we were looking uh, how, at how containers in particular, but more broadly, how they interact, how do you interact uh, with containers uh, using workflow systems? Uh, and we also touched on the, uh, in the on the same context in the in the sort of cloud space. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, 
perhaps drop the MPI for now and and, and look into adopting a, a workflow system uh, for your analysis. That's the the take take home, uh, and we looked into how to def so from again from my end, it's no surprise there. It was uh, how you would uh, use uh, containers with Nextflow, and the, another upside being uh, that you know you you then uh, outsource the the handling or wrapping of the of the container. Uh, you know, so, so container specific syntax to to your workflow management system, um, and the extra bonus that that you get uh, in terms of portability of your workflows uh, uh, from that. Um, so yeah, that was mainly next for me. And Michael, uh, I'll I'll let you uh, briefly outline because you've covered quite a lot of ground there with uh, with the alternatives. Yeah, so I mean, exactly what Rad said. We looked at workflow systems and like Nextflow, uh, CWL, WDL, and the engines that go with them and how containers can interact and, and provide some, some benefits. Um, we talked a bit about the benefits of workflow systems generally, like uh, checking return codes, checking inputs, outputs, uh, resuming and pausing workflows. Um, and then when you add in containers, how you can move your workflow from running locally with Docker to moving to an HPC and letting the engine submit your jobs to, to Slurm or to PBS, or then take it to the cloud and let your workflow engine submit to uh, Google cloud or the pipelines or the batch API through AWS. Um, so giving you that flexibility. Uh, and then we also like we specifically went through uh, CWL tool and Cromwell and showed you how you can, with a, a few lines, make it run a Docker or make it run a Singularity container. Yeah. And did you have any point on this of discussion about say running on HPC versus cloud? Uh, I mean, you just mentioned Google Cloud and other providers, but uh, any other points to add on on these? We we talked about uh, managed cloud providers as well. I mean, that kind of strays a little bit from the point you're trying to make, but um, things like Seven Bridges Genomics or uh, NF Tower or um, uh, or Terra from from the Broad as platforms where I have a workflow and I just want to run it and I don't really care how it runs. Um, we talked about some of the, we didn't really talk too much about the differences between cloud and HPCs, except that, uh, I guess the big difference and you see it more with using containers is you only have available what uh, you explicitly make available into the container by the like bind pass for, through singularity or, or attaching volumes. That's like especially apparent on the cloud where your files usually sit in an S3 or a GCS bucket and to, to make them available to your compute, you like physically need to localize them to some storage and then make that available. And workflow systems take care of that for you. Um, but by using containers, you sort of already broach that topic of, I need, need to understand what I want upfront and I can't just like reference some arbitrary path on my system. Uh, just a curiosity on Janice, uh, <laughs> you're here with us. Do, do you, are you providing any uh, interface with the Kubernetes clusters right now? Or is, is, it in the, is it in the plans? Yeah, so Kubernetes is really interesting. Um, we, so for the context of everyone, Janus is like a, a Python framework that we built that generates CWL and WDL. And we provide some like token interface for running those workflows and CWL tool and Cromwell. Uh, and then behind the scenes, we go out and validate a lot of CWL and WDL, make sure it works in all the different environments that we say it does. Um, CWL should be supported by a number of different engines like Calrissian or Rihanna. Um, so the theory is we should just take this, the CWL that we've generated and run it on there. And we're really sort of keen to try and get it to run on something like GVL, which is, by, which is now backed by Kubernetes and, and has that, have that as a use case. So the theory is that it should run. Um, everyone says that like CWL should run on this and we just got to go ahead and validate it. Thank you. Uh, so, the schedule. So, okay. So, Alexandra, do you want to to comment on on your room? 
Sure, just very briefly, we, we decided to try and install um, Singularity on a Windows laptop so that uh, Erika could carry on with you know, what she's been learning yeah. here uh, on her own machine. And um, yeah, we didn't manage to get to the end. <laughs> it is quite a few steps on Windows. Uh, one thing that we discovered is um, when trying to um, get background background to build um, a, a, a box, it complains about, and I'm, we weren't sure what was the reason, but it complains about not being able to find the box, but then uh, mostly it was about the SSL certificate problem. Okay. And we think that may have something to do with the fact that Erica sits behind a firewall because she's in the office right. where we have lots of things that, um, you know, are meant to um, protect us, which is fine. Uh, so after, you know, Googling and stack overflowing, <laughs> we find a solution uh, we found a solution and, um, we, we still are, we still need to install actually Singularity. Yeah. It looks like we're almost there. So um, yeah, just, uh, just I guess, good learning experience um, that it is still um, quite complex to, to get it to run on a Windows machine. Yeah. And um, you know, it's, in our case, uh, I mean, it can be a case for, for many researchers that for whatever reason there are in a Windows machine and they have to get it to run. So um, from that point of view, it's, it's, it was a good learning experience that it's, you know, it's just several steps and then weird things keep coming up. And interestingly enough, uh, she had both Gitbash and Mobax Term and Mobax Term could not see Vagrant after it was installed. So I guess that needs to be some fiddling with path that Mobax term sees. So for whatever reason, but the Windows Windows native command line could see Vagrant. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I think this is how it would possibly run it on Windows. I mean, mob, uh, if you're just running Singularity locally, I, I think there's no need to use Mobax term for that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, and it's just that, you know, sometimes some Windows users are used to Mobax term because it's often, so in our case, in New Zealand, that's the recommended way of using yep. our national HPC. Yep. And so I thought that's okay, let's just stick with yep, one yep. Makes sense. tool that emulates Linux on, on uh, Windows. But yeah, we had to switch to Gitbash. <laughs> so that's, that's all from us, I guess. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, from so I have a, a, a related question. Having tried to install, or I think I did install in the end Singularity under WSL2 on Windows the other day. A couple of years ago, there were good Debian packages around for Singularity. Are there still up-to-date Debian packages around for Singularity? It seems like it's regressed. Nero Debian was maintaining some and it was easy. And now it seems like it's a case of install go, compile from source. Is, am I right or am I not finding mm. I don't know. My experience too. Yeah, I, I agree with what you, what Andrew just said. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not. Okay, I'm not just missing the 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 Debian packages that are that are there. It's like no one's building them anymore. And okay. Andrew, just to press is that uh, so that would that would be to install Singularity in a smoother way. Or yeah. So in, in for Singularity itself. Or, or, okay. Yeah. So running running Linux on Windows 10 is now pretty streamlined right. with WSL2. Um, it works quite well and you don't need to muck around with Vagrant or VirtualBox oh. or any of that. Um, it's, it's pretty good, but yeah, you used to be able to go, you know, add the Neuro Debian repos and then go apt get install Singularity dash LLNL or something and, and off you go. And now, that those packages are getting woefully out of date. Wow. And it it's just seem curious to I, yeah. I'm just I'm, curious, so WSL2, is it uh, kind of built on top of a Debian? Uh, so you can install, there's a couple of distros available, you know, but you can have Ubuntu or CentOS or whatever. Uh -huh. it's, That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just going to comment, um, 
I imagine the majority of people in this meeting have access to one of the academic research clouds. And personally, as, as a Linux user on my laptop, I would still rather be using a VM in Nectar than I would installing stuff on my laptop. And I think that goes double for anyone operating on Windows or Mac OS. So it might be worth looking at which academic research clouds you have access to, if any. I mean, Nectar, Nimbus, and I'm not sure what Nessie's doing at the moment. I know that we support Nessie login to the Nectar Research Cloud. So, sorry, to Akiri login to Nectar Research Cloud. So we must give something to New Zealanders. <laughs> but, um, and related to that, I wonder if the images which Marco has used for the VMs for this training session are available on Nimbus slash Nectar. To uh, spin up. <laughs> so I have, I have the, the template image. Yeah, it's private. It's mine. I mean, it's, it's in my space, but I can share it. Sure, yeah. It's basically, I mean, that is not really fancy. There is, I think there was Docker and Singularity pre-installed, and then I just pre-cached the, the container images that were required, but yeah, I can, I can share that. Uh, yeah. Um, so if you, uh, for Nectar, uh, so you, just let me know the, the format you would, you would like. <laughs> and, ah, okay, no, I thought you, you were thinking of, of the, also the deployment uh, from, from your side directly. But yeah, I mean, I, if people are interested, uh, just get in touch. Say for Nimbus, it's here at Pos, it's quite straightforward because I still have the image here. For, uh, for Nectar, uh, I imagine it would be about just, yeah, getting in touch with the Nectar ops and uh, getting it done. Yeah. But my, my take on that is uh, in the end, once you have Docker and Singularity installed, you're more, almost good to go. And I am providing, let's see, I, uh, I am providing some uh, template uh, Ubuntu scripts to install uh, Docker and Singularity. Um, let me just put you the link. So basically it's in the setup page of the webinars and these workshops. And there's a Docker one and a Singularity one. So everyone with a VM based on Ubuntu and possibly Debian, I haven't tested it, but I imagine it, it should work. Uh, they should just be able to install Docker and Singularity that way. And, and then they're basically almost done. But, uh, Maybe what we should actually do is to lean on Nectar Core Services to get a Nectar official image with some of the useful bits yep. already in it. Yep. And then it's got the higher level of trust as having yep. Nectar. So it's, that, that's what we do at POSIS, where we have a base image that already ships with, uh, with those. And uh, yeah. Uh, if, ne if the Nectar folks are keen, I think yeah, it can be a good idea. That, that's what we are doing and it, it's, people are liking that because they spawn the VM and they're ready to go with the containers, basically. You and I will have to talk later. Yeah. <laughs> so on, on Nectar, you already can get, uh, uh, you know, uh, images. It's really, really easy to spawn a, an, an instance with, with the Docker setup. So yeah, you need an extra, need this extra step for Singularity, I guess. but. Yeah, Docker's already available. Good, thanks, Red. Um, all right, the last room, okay, it's me. <laughs> Good, so before commenting on, on my room, I just wanted, uh, I just, just noted down a little comment from the first room that I missed the opportunity to make before. So uh, people from the first room were, were discussing whether they should, for instance, include databases in containers or not. And they just wanted to share our take on that regard. So we, we normally encourage people not to include databases in containers uh, and trying to make the point and the distinction between the actual software stack, so the tool set, the, the, the packages and executables, and what are effectively data. So it's true that databases are a, a key component of a, pro, of, a, of a pipeline, but they are not a software component. And uh, one key aspect there is that databases get updated quite often. Um, so including that in a container would mean that you, if you want to maintain that, you need to constantly update the container just because the database is, has been updated and say, we can make the example of Blast or other tools that have a, a continuously updated database. So with what we normally suggest people is to avoid uh, including the database in the containers and uh, possibly ensure that it's uh, straightforward to, to download the database from the container in a host location. And then you can use bind mount mechanisms so that you have the database in the host and you just bind mount it in the container for usage. 
and uh, and that's and this is working quite well. Uh, the Blast example is quite straightforward. I also I, I can't recall the name of the packages. In some cases, it's a bit more weird because there are assumed locations for the database, so you need to play with the directory names when you bind mount. Uh, but the procedure in itself is quite robust, and it permits to separate the frequency of updates of the database compared to the uh, software stack. Um, any comment on this by other people? If not, ah. I, I fully agree. I don't don't include the not including the databases in, in the containers. It makes the container size massive as well for yep. something like like a VEP where you might not need the whole the whole database to do it anyway. Yeah, when you're um, saying, oh, sorry. No, talk, talk with her. Uh, sorry, when you're saying that, you mean um, like not including any of the data in the database, but would it be all right to containerize a database, like a containerized instance of like MongoDB or something like that, and then feed data into it or? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we use uh, containerized databases for everything as long as you're, um, <laughs> Your your binding in the the volumes probably I, I wouldn't recommend storing the unless you're using singularity layers or something. Okay, cool. uh, I guess my comment about uh, I think it's I agree. Generally, you should keep the databases outside the container and bind to them, especially when they're large. Um, but some of the arguments for that don't really stand up because people don't update their databases that often always, and sometimes software updates more frequently than databases. And so it's, it's not entirely clear cut, <laughs> um, but, um, and if the databases are small and not changing fast, then they come in, uh, I think for ease of use. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure it's entirely clear cut, but as a general rule, if you're baking in your reference genome to your container, then you're probably doing it wrong. And if you're baking in your blast, blast database, you're probably doing it wrong. Yeah. Does yeah. reproducibility enter that discussion at all though? I mean, yes. <laughs> there's an argument to include the version at least of the database that you're using in order to be able to reproduce your results. And the easiest way to include the correct version is to include the database in the container. Um, I throw it back to workflow systems. Most of our workflow systems will store what version you did, what version of the file you ran with and well, the path to it and probably a hash of it. I mean, yeah. just because it's the easiest way. I mean, yeah, it, it is the easiest way to do it, but you know. Yeah, I, I agree with Michael. I mean, it's, uh, I see it most as a workflow reproducibility issue rather than a software stack issue. So you need to keep track of the versions when you are actually developing a reproducible workflow. So it should be part of the protocol of your analysis, I think. And what it about doesn't necessarily it? match with the Blast version, for instance, right? It needs to be documented and, and tracked, but it doesn't have to be in a container. It can be, once you know the version, say you don't have any compiled issues with, that, with, a, with a base of data, right? It's a, it's a zipped archive and, or whatever, but uh, whereas with the co you use containers to solve the issue of also of building reproducible software stacks. So yeah, I would say it's important to track the version of the database, but yeah, you don't need containers for, for that. And what if I were to play devil's advocate and suggest that your workflow system needs to be in the container too? So you've got that version <laughs> controlled. Okay, next. Uh, I, next I agree uh, with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move on uh, to this briefly commenting on our room. So um, it was a nice discussion on uh, MPI and GPU enabled containers. <clears throat> so we had uh, Johans uh, here from Curtin was interested in running the Guppy base color, the GPU version of it in containers. So we basically yeah, commented on that. It's one of those cases where there is no, there is not a bio containers uh, package for Guppy. So I'm, I had worked with the tool before, so it's one of these cases where I could uh, identify a trustable source that was not biocontainer, so it was a research center in Paris, in, in France. So I was happy enough with, uh, with the source, and so that's the one that became part of the workflow. And then we discussed, yeah, what you need to run a GPU container. So on the singularity side, it's normally that just an additional flag. And then the, if you are in an HPC system, the interplay with the resource manager is quite straightforward, uh, as we saw in the webinars a couple of weeks ago. 
Uh, then we also discussed briefly on uh, how one could uh, build a GPU container. So NVIDIA provides some base images on Docker Hub uh, to that end. And basically all, uh, all you need apart from uh, an NVIDIA base image is just uh, a CUDA driver in, in your machine. And you can get that even if you don't have a GPU. I mean, the build itself can work. I did that. I did that on a, on a, on a CPU virtual machine. I, I just needed this uh, the availability of the, of the drivers, and then I, I made the build, and then I moved the container to to the HPC system, and and uh, and the the GPU take care of the of the workload. Um, what else? And then we moved a bit towards the MPI side of the story. So we 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 went back to the to some contents that we went through in the webinars so how to configure the share environment uh, with appropriate bind mounts and uh, ld library paths so that the M mpi application in the container is able to not only use the host mpi library which is kind of straightforward but also the host installation of the interconnect libraries uh, which can be quite painful to, to set up. Uh, so I, I would never recommend any, any research or user to do that. It's just a free, free pain for you. Just ask the system administrators. <laughs> ask until you find someone willing to do that for you. Spend a couple of evenings on that. If you have a Cray, it's kind of easier for once because uh, there is a conference paper detailing that. So that's what I did here at POSI for Magnus. I, I followed a, a publication and I just said to add a couple of more modifications and then we had a working uh, configuration for MPI containers on, on a Cray. Uh, for non-Cray systems, it can be a bit more time consuming, but yeah, I would involve some uh, IT staff of the, of the center in doing that. Um, failing to do that, of course, it's just about performance. So you can, you can easily have an MPI container working uh, the, 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 miss, the, the, the gap is uh, whether you're able to, uh, to reach bare metal performance or not. And that's, that's where you need to configure the interconnect libraries appropriately uh, inside the container. Uh, so we, I built a bit of experience here at POSI. It's, uh, there's, I still have a lot of trial and error component in that. Um, it's, it's, some, it's one of those cases where it just start to to put together enough expertise to have a, a robust and simple uh, protocol for these things. But uh, any IT support here in interested, I'm happy to have a chat about that. Um, yeah, and then we had also in our room a little conversation about uh, reproducibility of workflows. Um, pretty much similar uh, um, takeaways compared to what other rooms uh, discussed. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we're getting close to, to wrap up for this event. I just maybe, I, yeah, exactly. I wanted to ask if anyone has got uh, any question or points of discussion uh, at this point uh, about any topics that we covered or not covered, but still relevant to, the, to, this, uh, to these teams. Uh, yeah, that's a good time to, to chat. Uh, I was, uh... We sort of moved on uh, from with a discussion about uh, databases and uh, whether you put, include them or not. Is there anything we could uh, do about uh, many small files uh, with containers? Where we, uh, anyone who knows runs the storage infrastructure that's supporting uh, millions of small files. Um, I mean, I, it, it occurred to me that <coughs> if uh, uh, da some data was wrapped up in a in a container that it was uh, it was going to be one single big uh, read off the off the file system rather than you know several thousand but uh, I guess that's uh, yeah. yeah I mean I, it's <laughs> yeah it's so we, problem, I we guess, have the area. issue here as well um, what I always say I mean ideally one would want to have a, a hardware solution to that so be able to offer some dedicated uh, file systems just for the purpose of running IO intensive workloads. Uh, right now, it, at this time of, uh, of, of the history, of course, we don't have that much availability on the hardware side. So we are actually resorting for some uh, researchers to the to a container solution. So Singularity, with Singularity, you can quite uh, easily mount uh, overlay file systems to the container when you run the application. 
So you can, uh, you can create a big single file, format it as a, for instance, an X3 file system or whatever, and then mount it as an overlay to the running container. And that way uh, you, can, uh, you can just read and write large number of files um, inside a single file on the, on the parallel file system. And I can tell you, I mean, I did, myself, I did a test once with actually the Albacore base caller, uh, uh, an older version compared to nowadays. Uh, so it was reading a, more than a million files and writing more than a million files. And I got a 2x speed up just by using the, the overlay solution with singularity. And I, have, I don't have figures for that, but uh, my colleague Alexis works with open form users and they set up similar solutions for open form workflows um with quite good uh, effective uh, results nice. um it's there's, not there's a video in process that talks about overlay fs right so, yeah i mean this was covered in one of the webinars uh, three weeks ago so yeah. we i believe actually in the biocommons youtube channel if you look for the third part of the webinars from three weeks ago you will find uh, 10 minutes of me talking about uh, 15 minutes talking about exactly this type of setup uh, here at posi we are in the process of rolling out uh, smaller youtube videos so for ease of uh, operation by by watchers but yeah okay. I, so, I think I can the webinar uh, contains that short version and yeah. then uh, alexis's video which will come right. soon we're in the process of doing final edits Okay. Um, that is a, um, I believe, a 60-minute discussion on how to use yeah. overlay of that. And that's right on the open phone case. So yeah. it can be of interest to definitely for that community. And True. maybe we can pass that along to you, Christina, um, when we get that video link. Right. Okay. So Thank you. I think David raised a really interesting point. If you're ever looking at benchmarks of containers, you sometimes find that they run faster than the native application. Yeah. And it's not actually because of the containerization, it's because of that overlay FS trick yeah. or similar where you've combined multiple small files into one. I think the one thing that you've got to be really careful of if you're running an overlay FS on an HPC system where you've got multiple nodes might be writing to the same file system, just don't. No. It's a read-only thing. If you try to write on it, you don't have full semantics ensuring that there's not overwrite and corruption going on there. Yeah, yeah. What we it becomes a bit tricky with MPI applications. So part of our solution was to engineer a way to have one overlay per MPI process, because otherwise, yes, it would fail. So it's, it's kind of easier for a lot of bioinformatics applications that are at most multi-threaded and hopefully they have just one thread writing. <laughs> uh, and I think that's the case. Yeah, there was a case of Albacore. I think this should be also the case of Trinity, for instance, which I used as, a, as an example for this as well. Uh, but yeah, there are some caveats there. It's, uh, um, you, one can make the short stories I did, but yeah, there is, a, there, there is a number of things to be careful about. Actually, the other thing I should point out is depending on which HPC sites you're working <laughs> at, if you're having a small file performance issue, it may be worth talking to them about local storage on the compute nodes. Sometimes it's worthwhile to copy all of your nodes from the global file system to the local compute system where you might have access to a super high speed disk. And do it yeah. there. And that's what I was mentioning. Uh, right now on Magnus, we don't have local storage, which is a bit of a shame. Hopefully, it will change in the future. Uh, at NCI, uh, I'm pretty sure Raging nodes add local storage, which was quite convenient. Uh, I'm not sure about Gadi, but I know now I'm yeah, helping out the, the other side of Australia. But uh, I think that in, the, in Gadi, there's quite, an, uh, quite amazing five systems available for this type of workflows. They bought a decent number of nodes with high speed local storage. So hopefully POSI will catch up soon. <laughs> um, David, are there, are there, um, are there you got other questions on this point? Uh, no, that's good, thanks. Yeah. It's uh, very useful. Right, are there other questions from the audience?
points of curiosity. Um, yeah, other than that, I mean, it's it's been great to so we'll be with you these three days. Uh, and I do have one more point. Of course, well, uh, oh, yes, right. I have to the real the voting survey. point. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> so the survey, please do uh, take a few minutes to complete that. Um, it is for longitudinal reporting purposes, and it provides data that we use um, to uh, give evidence that we need additional training. So likewise, in the survey, if you have ideas for additional training topics, uh, we'd love to hear them. Over to you, Christina. Thank you. I'll just start sharing again. Okay, that's a wrap. Well done, everyone. Thank you so much to Marco for the huge effort and endless enthusiasm uh, to design and deliver the content for these webinars and workshops. Thanks to Anne for your tireless organising behind the scenes and for ensuring everything worked on the day. Our volunteer facilitators uh, have made this training event possible for a larger group of people than we initially thought um, would be possible. And we hope you've made some great connections for the future there. We appreciate your commitment, facilitators, to helping the broader research community by donating your time to the development and rolling out of these workshops. And thank you to our audience for joining us for these, this three-part uh, workshop. It's been wonderful working with you and we hope you've made some advances in your thinking about containers that you can take back to your work and put into action. I'll remind you that we will let you know when the recordings are available for your review and you can share those widely with anyone you think might like to watch. We're thrilled you've been part of this first virtual and interactive bioinformatics training that combined live presentations with hands-on exercises and a BYO hacky component for an international audience with the support of a raft of um, facilitators from around Australia and New Zealand. And as Anne mentioned, um, please let us know how you found the workshop. It's really important that we hear what worked for you and what didn't so that next time when we meet in a training event, it will be sure to meet your needs. So head to the workshop, the link is there. It's going to the same place that Anne has given you um, and fill in the survey, it only takes a couple of minutes. And we hope after your time with us, you have a better understanding of the merits and limitations of using containers in your own work and that you're keen to get using containers in bioinformatics. Just before closing, we'd like to express our appreciation to our funding bodies. Australian Biocommons and Pawsey are enabled by NCRIS, and we'd like to acknowledge the support of the Government of Western Australia and Bioplatforms Australia. Thanks once again, and goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.